Does anyone have a question? This is the part where you ask questions and we make up answers. Yes, sir. Let's see, I'm gonna to try to boil that question down. Um, I think you're equating the price of gold with the price of crops, and more or less, or, or the increase in the money supply created by the Federal Reserve and 0% interest rates uh, has led to the price of commodities going up, including gold, and um, so some people think it's different because this will go on, um, and I don't understand how the gold plays in there, if you can help me with that. Okay. So, yeah, it's two different questions. Um, I think that uh, I tried to make a couple of points in, in uh, the talk that, um, that were probably rather subtle, that these low interest rates have provided the perverse incentive to stay in farmland as opposed to selling farmland because you can't get any higher interest rate or any higher return on that. Um, so, um, and, and the crop yield, um, you know, driven by China and India and wherever it may be, we don't know whether that's real, imagined, or, or what have you. I mean, there's speculation in those markets just like any other market. So, um, and generally bankers will leverage up this land and that's where the real problems will become. Because if that average 5% farmland loan becomes 7%, and it doesn't take too much imagination to imagine a 5% farm loan going to 7%, or even 10% for that matter, that will cut the legs completely out of this market. Really, no matter what happens to crop prices, they could stay the same. If crop prices were to come down at the same time we had a rise in interest rates, or a fall in the dollar, which would precipitate a rise in interest rates, um, the same thing could happen. So that's what I, the way I'd answer that part of the question. Um, gold is, um, I don't know, somebody else want to take a swing at the gold? Uh, is gold different this time? Is it, uh, is anybody arguing that uh, gold's a speculative bubble and, um, but it's different this time? Well, no, I, I mean, the way I would handle it is you're right. Would, I'm not telling people I think gold is going to, for sure, I'd bet my life gold's going to be higher next month than it is right now. It might not. I mean, gold could fall 20%. What I'm, the people I say you should hold gold, is it's more of like a hedge just in case Bernanke doesn't undo the stuff that he's done, which I don't trust that he will. Okay, so it's, 
In other words, it's not like, oh, the damage has been done, and now we just hope he doesn't do something more. I mean, he's pumped all that money in the financial sector that's just sitting there waiting. And until they suck those trillion dollars in reserves out, I would still tell people you want to have some gold. You know, Again, not as you're speculating it's going to go up next month, but just it's there so you don't get completely wiped out would be the way I would say it. I, I forgot one quick thing. I'm just making an announcement for the high school people in there. If you want to go to school in the area, I forgot to mention if Tyler Watts could just raise your hand. He is an Austrian at, at Ball State. He just wanted me to mention if you want to see him and Jim McClure as well, that they want to just you to know that they're in the area and, and they have a strong Austrian program there. Do you guys have an, uh, an opinion on? <laughs> no, that's OK. <laughs> Gold prices or uh, speculative land. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, they could. The government uses uh, taxes, borrowing, and money printing uh, to finance everything. And so, uh, yeah, in theory. But, of course, uh, with uh, printing money by the Fed makes, makes it easier for one thing. And it creates uh, what economists call a fiscal illusion in that, uh, uh, you know, I just I published an article a few months ago on uh, uh, in inflationary finance of uh, war. And imagine if uh, uh, President Bush, uh, trying to persuade us to go to war in Iraq, said, OK, it's going to cost a lot of money. It's, and I figure it's $20,000 per family. I think there'd be a lot more opposition to that war th than there was if he did that. So it makes it more difficult. But, but, uh, and therefore, there would be less of it if we just resorted to tax finance and not inflationary finance. But uh, uh, you know, that requires abolishing the Fed. Hold your applause, please. We want to continue. <laughs> Uh, with this. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the question again, the, the government holds a lot of land. land. Yeah, pretty much the, the, the entire western half of the United States is pretty much owned by the federal government. Uh, where I uh, came from, spent 22 years in Nevada, 86% of the land in Nevada is owned by uh, the federal government, by the BLM. And um, uh, there were reasons for that, actually, that uh, tie into a lot of work that uh, Professor DiLorenzo has done in terms of uh, Lincoln, actually, right? Uh, well, yeah, well, the, the home, you know, if, if you want to talk about history, the original Homestead Act in, in, in the 1860s, uh, uh, there's a historian uh, named Ludwell Johnson who uh, once published an article showing that uh, the majority of it went to corporations. You know, there were a lot of people who got 160 acres to farm, but he, he, uh, he, he made the case that over half of it went to mining, forestry, and railroad corporations. And, uh, and I think uh, more up to date, a lot of that land uh, historically has been leased to ranchers at below market prices. So it's a form of uh, pork barrel politics of a congressman making, giving a sweetheart deal to campaign contributors who are ranchers uh, or uh, our friends in Montana at the uh, Political Economy Research Center uh, for years have been uh, writing articles and books about how in the timber industry, you know, all the timber lands that are owned by the government are leased on the cheap to timber companies who then clear cut uh, the timber and create all kind of environmental devastation uh, compared to uh, on their own privately owned lands. They don't do that. They're much more careful. They they regrow it with super trees and that, that sort of thing. And so uh, so that's where the transitional gain strap would come from because there are the, the special interests who benefit from the government being able to control the land. And I, I would argue that the Bureau of Land Management is the most powerful special interest. There are a lot of bureaucrats and a lot of careers wrapped up in, uh, in being the bureaucrats that run the whole show. And that's where a lot of the opposition would come from uh, to privatizing it. But 
our friends in Montana, they used to say that 50% uh, of the land uh, west of the Mississippi is owned by the federal government. That's a statistic they used to use. In Nevada, what is it, 86% yeah, of the whole state of Nevada? And uh, I know in Nevada, in Doug's case, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really like the government is, operates like the mafia because when the developers, during the boom outside of Vegas, when the developers wanted to build land, the first thing they had to do, like all developers everywhere in any city, is bribe the politicians to let them buy the land that the government owned. Uh, and uh, like anywhere else, even if the government doesn't own the land, you still have to get permits. And so that's, that's how a lot of county commissioners and these people finance their political careers through sort of Tony Soprano-like uh, 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 activities. If you want to do business in town, you got to give me my share. Is essentially what they're saying, and it's perfectly legal, unlike uh, the mafia. Uh, uh, and so, but it's essentially the same thing. Anybody else? Uh, every once in a while, uh, there will be some kind of proposal to to privatize a small piece of, of a government-owned and managed area in the national forest, for example. Those proposals come along every once in a while. And whenever they do come along, there's a huge outcry from the environmental lobbies, uh, which are just completely invested in the idea that any movement of ownership from government to the private sector is wrong, a movement in the wrong direction. They would actually like to move more land under the control of the government. But this is also another uh, case where uh, the, the subsidies and the government management benefit uh, interests that you might not expect if you'd never really looked into how, how these programs operate. In the, in the national forests, for example, where the land is uh, leased to timber companies to, to, to cut the wood, uh, we know uh, there have been some studies by my old friend Barney Dowdle at the University of Washington that showed that, that the, the, the costs of managing the, the national forests uh, exceed the value of everything produced in the national forests. So <laughs> it's like a net loss just from the fact that the government is operating and managing these areas to begin with. But if you look at what national forests are for, you discover that they don't really exist to, to cater to forestry companies as much as they <laughs> exist to cater to road builders. There, there are more miles of road in the national forest system in the United States than in all the rest of the country combined. You know, all the interstate system, the state roads, the local roads, add them up. That's not as many miles. Of course, it's a different kind of road, but it just gives you an idea of how many hundreds of thousands of miles of roadway uh, have been built and continue to be built in the national forest. And, and of course, that's all made with contracts with uh, uh, road building companies. And uh, they make buku bucks from doing this work. And they, they have sweetheart arrangements with the people who manage particular areas of national forests and what have you. But this is also something that the, the environmentalists have fallen down on because uh, some of the biggest complaints about the uh, dis despoilation of, uh, of the national forests occur because the, all of this road building creates tremendous amount of erosion. And uh, it uh, wrecks the streams and rivers in these areas, kills fish and, and, and other riverine life. And so it's just terrible for the environment. It never should be happening in the first place because uh, you know, if people had to really pay market prices for, for their access to cutting this timber, the whole system would operate differently. Well, I came from, the again, the Soviet Union was called uh, environmental Auschwitz in the sense that they destroyed the, the, the nature more than anybody else. Uh, however, I had a strange, very strange experience where the state of Nevada I was uh, invited by a very radical group there to talk about um, Bureau of uh, Land Management and, um, and how the, the mining claims are being served and whatnot. And so my point was that government does not have any any role in ownership of land, and that definitely should be privatized. However, amazingly enough, my, my hosts, who were pretty radical at that time, Bruce Babbitt, maybe you remember, he was a home secretary 
And he was raising grazing fees per cow, like almost 40% up. And, um, and so they, they were pretty radical. They would were, they were invite me to a pub, and they were just throwing darts into his eyes, put his picture there, and, <laughs> and, uh, and um, oh, Bruce Babbitt and Janet Reno and whatnot. And, uh, <clears throat> However, when I said that they should be, they said, "No, no, this is ridiculous. No, this uh, we don't need this. We don't want this, uh, this land at all. They wanted just to reduce the grazing fees, reduce grazing fees, keep them low, so they can rape the land which belongs not to them. And that's exactly what 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 was all, all Soviet agriculture was about. Just you rape you. You don't think about tomorrow. You just, you just do that right now." So the, so the question is, uh, does the executive branch have the power uh, if, if uh, the right libertarians were elected, um, if they could just shut the tap off at the Department of Agriculture, just, just stop it. You, you guys all go sit and do nothing, uh, you know, download, download uh, porn all day, what they do at the SEC or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, I, yeah, I'm certainly not qualified for the question. Any? Yeah, the, the first thing people would say is that, uh, well, the, con the Constitution gives Congress the power of the purse, and so they could force the president to do it. But nobody in Washington pays attention to the Constitution anymore. Whenever Democrats talk about the Constitution, it's only to try to block something the Republicans want to do. And whenever the Republicans talk about the Constitution, it's only to block something the Democrats want to do. But, but neither party believes in, in uh, limited constitutional government. About five years ago, uh, Ron Paul invited me to go to, down to his office in DC and give a presentation based on my book, uh, The Real Lincoln, to him and his uh, Liberty Caucus, about a dozen members of Congress. And during that the evening, one of the things they all agreed on is about a dozen members of Congress is that no one in Washington will take you seriously if you try to make a constitutional argument against any kind of government program. They all nodded in agreement with that. And so uh, and my answer to your question is, uh, yeah, why, why shouldn't a president do this? And then it should give the Congress the big middle finger if they start talking about the Constitution. And the same with the Supreme Court. You know, I think we should, we, this idea that the Supreme Court is uh, black robed deities who, who announce to us what our freedoms are to be uh, did not always exist. It's a post-Civil War uh, phenomenon. Before the Civil War, uh, there were, uh, Andrew Jackson, for example, when the, when the Supreme Court said the Bank of the United States, which was a precursor of the Fed, was constitutional, he, he responded by, in essence, saying, uh, thanks for your opinion, but my opinion is different. And so, uh, so we didn't always bow down to these black robe deities of the court. And, uh, and I think uh, we'll never have freedom again in America, really, until we start giving every member of the Supreme Court the big middle finger, too, and say, so what? You know, that's your opinion. Keep it to yourself. Uh, you know, we have, a, we have uh, and Andrew Jackson reminded the court at the time that there are three branches of government, not one. And so, so this was an invention that the, the Supreme Court has the sole arbitrary, whole sole power to decide on constitutionality. So I could see a, a Ron Paul uh, type president uh, just doing it and doing it and confronting Congress because they don't believe in the Constitution. So why, why should uh, we use it? There, there was. Uh an attempt, several attempts uh, during the Reagan administration to impound authorized funds. And it gave rise to court challenges which went to the Supreme Court and uh, the drift of the rulings was that the, the executive may not uh, unilaterally impound these funds. Now, uh, as Tom says, if the executive branch 
were willing to say, the hell with the Supreme Court, it wouldn't matter because the Supreme Court is just uh, nine persons with, with no private army of its own. Uh, on the other hand, if the executive were to act that way uh, in current political circumstances, it would run a tremendous political risk. And uh, I'm willing to say, it, although no one knows the future, that it would end up being totally repudiated. Uh, because even though the Supreme Court has no army to enforce its rulings, it, it still has a considerable power of public opinion behind its rulings. And the uh, people dispute the rulings, of course, greatly for all kinds of reasons. But that's different from disputing the authority of the, of the court to exist and make constitutional rulings. And I think if, if the executive branch took that position, it would find itself uh, very much on the losing end of the political fallout. So I think maybe it was easier to do in the Jackson's day than it would be today. Ultimately, the only way to, uh, to, to, to achieve this is to do what happened in the former Soviet Union and have all the states secede and create one that's a, a, a society of liberty rather than the society of tyranny, which we live under today. Yeah, we'll all move to Indiana. Uh, I take it the Monsanto issue with the using uh, intellectual property laws to uh, keep their seeds from being used by anybody else, right? Is that, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, my view of that would be that that's a, not a, 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 legitimate right, a legitimate right that they have and, and they're keeping uh, food out of people's mouths. And uh, they're using the power of government, uh, the power of their lobbying efforts to um, keep small farmers out of the market. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I personally wouldn't be uh, a Monsanto fan, or at least the way they do business. Anybody else? This is by no means um, something I did a lot of research on or anything, but I have talk with a few people that were, you know, in agriculture that didn't seem to be demonstrably insane. And, um, you know, the guy didn't, you know, then talk about how the aliens mistreated him or anything. Uh, and, and he was saying it's not just the issue of, you know, sort of aggressive practices, but he was saying stuff. And I, again, I, I didn't verify this, but this is what he was telling me that, like, if, if the breeze blows the seed onto your land and then Monsanto can come in and prove that you have some of their strain then you have to pay them money, even if like you didn't buy the product and put it, it just the, the wind took it on. And, and he was saying like sort of there are some small independent farmers that just hate everything they stand for, and yet the stuff they can't keep it off their land, and then now they're stuck having to pay them, and then it you know they can't even remain independent if they wanted to. So if if that's true, certainly that sounds crazy to me. Yes, sir. The effects on agriculture during Chairman Mao's what? Great leap, Great leap forward. I'm sure that's what they figured it was. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I can't speak with any genuine authority about that, but from what I have read about it, uh, the effects of the Great Leap Forward in agriculture were were very bad in terms of, uh, uh, of hurting the productivity of agriculture at the time. One of the things that uh, the government did during the Great Leap, so-called, was, was to, 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 to absolutely, absolutely clean out the cities and force people, at least for a period of time, to go out and work on farms. Can you imagine anything worse for farming than having a whole bunch of in, totally inexperienced city slickers sent out to help you farm? 
And it's a disaster. We used to hate it when people came out to hunt pheasants and ducks on our farm. But uh, <laughs> uh, th this, had, this had to be very harmful. And it was done uh, really for ideological reasons. It was to basically break everybody's will and spirit by showing them that they could be put out in the country doing very hard, unpleasant work. Uh, and in fact, they, they, they had to do it, like it or not, and uh, whether they enjoyed the pay or the conditions or whatever. So the, the idea was, you know, we we're going to create this new man, and the first thing we had to do is destroy the old man's type of thinking uh, by, by breaking him, just the way when you go in the military, the first order of business is to break you so you'll do automatically anything you're told to do. Well, I was one of these um, slick uh, <laughs> urban dwellers. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in the Soviet Union, they would send um, most people. When I was a student, every September and October, I would spend in um, uh, pretending that I'm picking up potatoes. Yes. That was a massive. Well, at that time, I was uh, pretty young or whatever, so I, had, I just had a great time. Uh, others, uh, older people, they were just drinking themselves into oblivion there. Nobody was picking up potatoes. <laughs> Only to only to put them in the fire and, uh, and then eat them with the with the with the pickles uh, or whatever. But but in China, I had a friend who was a Soviet advisor. Can you imagine Soviet advisor to a Chinese uh, Department of Labor? And 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 he was part of that. And his stories were just amazing. That for example, they decided to kill all yard birds, sparrows. They're considered sparrows, and we are attacked by sparrows because they eat a lot of grain and a lot of rice. And so the whole country was murdering sparrows. And he was, as a Soviet advisor, also recruited because he needs to show his, uh, his understanding of that. And they would come with pots and pans and beat them to the point that poor sparrows have, and, and sparrows cannot fly more than five minutes. They have a heart attack and they drop. And then people would fight each other to pick up sparrows because they need to show them. And then if you have enough dead sparrows, then they exchange it for a medal. Yes, yeah, so can you imagine? And then, and then I worked for the Soviet Department of Labor, and my minister, uh, usually I would go to him, because I worked with the Minister of Labor, and, and he would call and would say, don't draft him, because I need him, yeah, so just draft somebody else instead. And, uh, and, I, and I was kind of, because he would, he would all the time would do that, and I, and I asked him, uh, uh, this is, uh, what, what's this for? I mean, what's this for, this? Uh, uh, it doesn't help agriculture. I was kind of naive and whatever. He said, yeah, but it, it keeps people a little bit more humble. Yes, it's like the TSA today. Yeah, they can, can take your picture if naked or whatever, or do the tricks you like to. And the same thing, that you have a family responsibility, you have a lot of things to do. And they will say, no, this is not important. Just go, and they will drive you, you on a school bus 10 hours from Moscow, dump you in the middle of a swamp, and that's it for two months. And that was it. And, and um, in, in, in China, that was, I think, the last coffin. They, they, they've beaten into, into entrepreneurship and creativity of Chinese people at that time. Uh, after that, everybody was submissive. The, the, the human toll of, of that experiment with agriculture in China alone was 16 million people died because of starvation during the Great Leap Forward. That's, that's a wonderful also, those of you who are interested in, in murders and crimes of socialism, you can look at the <coughs> University of Hawaii, uh, .edu, and then slash Rammel. Rammel, that's Professor Rudolf Rammel of University of Hawaii. He wrote a lot of books about democide, about, about government murdering their own people. I think the best one is called Death by Government. Death by Government. His point was that this is the worst disease that you can have is government. And government is murderous diseases, worse than AIDS or anything else. I'm not a great fan of, of, the, of, the, of the Prime Minister, Mr. Putin, nor his spokesman, President Medvedev. Uh, they are all kind of KGB stooges. But even under, I would say, kind of 
how fascist thing they have. It's still a great leap forward because what they did now, Russia became, Russia became a net exporter of grain again. Uh, moreover, they're exporting almost as much as grain as the United States does. In the year 2019, they have this. I don't know if it's a rather statistical delusion or not. They think they will become the first in the world in, the, in exporting grain. Most of this uh, Arab unrest in the Arab countries was not because people were looking for freedom or read too much of Mises and Hayek and began to throw out their, 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 their social, social parasites away. No, because food prices increased by 70, 80% in all these countries, mostly because of the huge draft in the southern Russia. Southern Russia is producing a lot of cheap, low quality, but food grain, which is mostly was exported to countries in developing world into these countries. And so today, today it's much better. What they do, they, they kind of privatize it, uh, those who would like to assume their property. The, the problem is that it's, I think it's a huge human, human disaster. For example, I, I, um, I go to Baltic states all the time. In Estonia, I met a gentleman from, from Finland. He was buying land there, buying land for almost nothing. For what reason? His point is that, that they privatized all land properly. Everything is private. But already peasants, they hate this land because for them, it's kind of part of the privatized, privatized concentration camp. There were slaves in. So they don't value this land, they sell it cheap, they want, they want to go to, to the cities and, and forget about all these atrocities that they experience. So it's, uh, it's really, really pretty sad, but now it's again, it's much better that, than, than it was. Yes, yes, yes. They, um, in the beginning, they stole with privatization of land. It was nationalized, whatever. But, but since 1995-96, they began to privatize. It's still about half of it is, is publicly owned, even today. All right, yeah. I'd uh, love to hear more about this, but I'm afraid we have to shut it down. I am uh, very pleased that you all came. Thank you for my speakers, Yuri Maltsev, Bob Higgs, Robert Murphy, and of course Tom DiLorenzo here behind me. Thanks to the crew of uh, Chad Parrish and Will and, and James and Christy, of course. Um, but it was a pleasure to be here in Indianapolis. We hope we can come back next year. Thank you to Weaver Popcorn for making this all possible. If you have a chance to buy a book on your way out, please do. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.